Well, that if, you, if you describe aggressive, you, you have to define aggressive. And uh, Karen Overall defines aggressive as, you know, even even barking in an aggressive manner is, is aggression or demonstrating aggression. So, okay. you know, we, we have to sort of come to some decision on how we define our terms. So many dogs are aggressive, but is the behavioral diagnosis, is it territorial aggression? Is it protective aggression? Is it dominance aggression, in terms of someone going out of favor now? Uh, is it anxiety aggression? Out of all of those terms, I see more fear aggression than anything. Sue, so what do you think on that? I, I, th I have to agree for the most part. <clears throat> There's different types of aggression, I can say. And um, there's also dogs that are assertive that are not quite aggressive, that people will call aggressive. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's a tough, tough area. Yeah. Yeah, it is a tough area. Yes. Yeah. To take the aggression question one step further, uh -huh. um, I have a dog who was a happy, confident, easygoing dog, became hypothyroid, became very aggressive. Mm -hmm. We've got the hypothyroid under control. I would say yes. I would say there's a good chance it would help. Did you hear that too? Okay, she has a dog that was aggressive and was diagnosed with an underlying problem of hypothyroidism. Okay? And for, for years, you know, hypothyroidism is well recognized in dogs, and there are some who want to blame everything on hypothyroidism, some in my profession. And it took me a, some amount of time to, to come to the conclusion that, yes, some behavior problems are due to hypothyroidism. So now she has corrected the hypothyroidism in the dog, and the dog has some learned aggressive behaviors. Can behavior modification help the dog? Depends, again, on the circumstances of the dog and how long it's, it's behavior. The longer a dog does something, the harder it is to undo it. Sure. And wouldn't you also agree though, my observation is the biggest factor is how much the people are willing to put into it. Some people are not capable. And I understand that. Yeah, willing is a bad term. Or willing or capable. You're right. exactly right. right. Some are not willing, some are not capable, and some situations dictate that it's not wise to try. Yeah. Exactly. I, I agree with that 100 percent And as far as capable and willing, let me just say this. I will never be a dog trainer. I don't have the patience for it. I couldn't do it. I can't do stay. Good dog. Now I'm going to go back three steps. Man, I get tired of that. I couldn't do it. Those who can't do teach. Right? So here I am. All right. <laughs> Sue's doing what she's doing. Here I am. Yeah. yeah her behaviors come back, I'd say, probably 75%. That last 25% is counting. You know, it's only situational, but it's still something yeah. that we have to deal with. Yeah. So the first thing you do is obviously you need to avoid those situations where it's going to manifest itself. And that's, that's always the, the first debate. Yeah. Yes? Have you seen much success with thought flower essences and natural herbals and uh, products like that? I know I do sell that in my shop. And We've really been able to help people if they use it consistently for mellow out, crisis, situations, sibling rivalries. And if they're using it regularly over time, we get great feedback. And my mind is open to it, but I have no experience with it. Great and, feedback. And can't tell you. How about you, Susan? Do you know? Um, sometimes, but you also, uh, from a scientific point of view, you have to analyze this. The, the uh, herbal remedy or the owner's changed attitude towards the dog. So it's not a clear cut, cut thing. Yeah. Um, with, with natural remedies and all, what you know, I would love to see clinical trials done to actually measure the effects. But you know, the way that things work in our country is that clinical trials don't get carried out unless somebody's willing to pay for them. And if somebody who's willing to pay for them is drug companies measuring the effects of the drugs that they're putting out on the market. So for most of these things, whether it's Bach flower remedies or whatever, nobody has the millions of dollars that's going to get through and get that as an approved FDA medication. And 
just isn't going to happen. So unfortunately, we're in a bad situation as far as that is, is, that, as far as that is, uh, is concerned. Yes? Yeah, we spend a lot of time talking about aggression in the dog. Yes. Has there ever been any effort to study how to give a dog back or cat a the will to live when it's traumatized, separation, loss of other, or something like that? You know? Okay. I've, I've researched it and I've never found anything. The, the question is, has there been studies done to give a dog the will to live when they're separated from their owner? And even more so cats. I know we're talking about More so cats, cats, yeah. You know. Well, I don't know. See, tell me if this tangentially involves your point. One thing that I'm, one aspect of my profession of which I'm just really, really proud is that in the last decade and a half, we have become so, so sensitive to pain, to, to addressing pain in pets. And uh, so that now most veterinary schools have a department of pain management. And we have come up with various medications and various techniques to reduce pain. And what we find with cats, in so many instances where we were addressing physiological problems, if we just address the pain, they, they then have the will to live. Well, I'm talking about an eight-year-old fat cat that the owner dumps off of the shelter. OK. So. And that cat, tell me more. It's in the shelter, it's depressed. Instead of any, any of the big, fat, older cats I've gotten in, they just they stop eating. They mm -hmm. just absolutely have no will to live. Yeah. You know, you spend one on one time with them, these special treats and everything. Mm -hmm. You know, I've tried the box and flower remedies and things like that, but, you know, it just seems to me they're always, I mean, I know the aggression is an important issue, but sometimes I like these things. Sure, yeah, there's a, aggression is one behavior category, and there's a bunch of other ones out there. There's you know, litter box and all that sort of thing. I just so it, it, the, the only thing I can tell you is that, and I think it's perhaps related, you know, in overweight cats, of which there are about two jillion out there, right, uh, they're really in danger of hepatic lipidosis, okay? And so once they stop eating, that just starts that vicious cycle. They start breaking down fats, getting ketones in their blood, that suppresses their, their appetite. And many of those cats, uh, the, the one thing that really helps is a feeding tube. I mean, that's the basic treatment for hepatic lipidosis is you just get, you get calories into that cat until they come around the bend. Uh, but it's, but that's you know, the, that's, I just to in terms of the psychological or psychosocial effects or how to treat that, that behaviorally, I, I don't know. Is that not answering your question? Well, essentially, I, 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 I just believe it's, it really has, we really have to put very little effort into how to, how to give them back their health to live. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. The pack mentality. Uh, I work in a doggy daycare, and we have sometimes 50 dogs. And I don't ascribe to the pack mentality, but others there do. Is there so anything other than pack mentality to describe groups of dogs that prefer to play with one another, or if you divide them by size and play and bring one dog from, say, this area into the other group of dogs? And there's a scuffle. I mean, is there? There's not a pack. Is there a group? Yeah, I, I, I think so. I mean, if you put a bunch of people together, <laughs> and especially if you have a black lightness and alcohol, <laughs> we, act a, we act a whole lot differently than a bunch of people that just walked into the First Episcopal Church on Sunday morning, right? Okay. Definitely. I mean, we, there, so there are different kinds of pack mentality. And so, you know, our friend Cesar, who I was decrying earlier, yes. I, I think that there are some things that he does that are that are uh, that have merit. And one of those things is, for instance, teaching that you know, if your dog goes into a group of dogs, that dog needs to just get snipped by all that pack. All right, and he needs to he needs to not resent that. Right. He, you know, we need to teach him that. The other thing that I that I like about Cesar, and I can you know count him on one hand is when he talks about his migration walks with his dogs, you know, and I, I tell this to my clients all the time, take your dog for a migration walk, and that is, you take your dog, you put him on a leash, and you walk for 25 minutes, and you don't stop and sniff at this bush, you don't stop and sniff at that bush, we're walking. Mm -hmm. And then at, at the end of 20 minutes, now you can go sniff at bushes. And so, and if you have a bunch of dogs, the same thing. 
So to that degree, 